Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, let them be acceptable in thy sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. There's a word from the Lord found in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the New Revived Standard Version of Matthew chapter 21. Verse 1 says, When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a coat, the foil of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blesses the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. It says in verse four that this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I want to talk about moving in purpose, moving in purpose. I think it's safe to say that Jesus was born to die. He was born to take away the sins of the world. In fact, before he was even born, before he was conceived, an angel of the Lord appeared in Nazareth and had a conversation with this hood chick, this ghetto girl, this teenage virgin named Mary. And the angel told Mary that you will conceive, you will give birth, you will name him Jesus and he will take away the sins of the world and establish the throne of David. Jesus was born to die to the point where whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved because it was Jesus who said, that nobody takes my life, I lay it down. He was born to die. In fact, in the book of Matthew, the chapter that we read today, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, it paints the, the picture of Jesus entering into Jerusalem as he is on his way to fulfill his purpose on Calvary. He's on his way to get arrested and to be beat and flawed, and he's on his way to be crucified on Calvary's hill. He's on his way to fulfill his purpose in death. He's pulling up on purpose. This is Mary's baby, Jesus the Christ, makes his way to Jerusalem and on his way to purpose. And Jesus is riding on a donkey, the king of kings riding on a donkey. It's in direct contrast to what the kings of the nations during that time would do as they would ride into cities on a white horse. And this horse and their entourage and all that glory and noise would represent the king's wealth and power and prestige as they would ride into the city on a horse with their entourage and their chariots behind them representing their power. But here is the king of kings. He enters into Jerusalem, pulls up on purpose, and he is riding on a donkey. He humbles himself, as the prophet says, that he humbled himself, mounted on a donkey, the king of kings, the one who is rich in houses and in lands, the, the, the one who owns a thousand cattle on a hill. He is now riding in on a donkey. He has the ability to stunt. He has the ability to show off. He has the ability to, to brag, but he's on a donkey. He's the king of kings, but he's also the king of the people, the king of an oppressed people. So he's riding in on a donkey, not showing off because he can show off. But I, I know that's hard for us to fathom in this social media era where all of us want to show off. We all want to show off our skills and our cars and our clothes. We all want to show off our houses and, and the achievements and awards that we get. It's all for the gram. 
It's all for the likes and for the views and for the cameras and for the brand and for the platform. But here is Jesus, even with all of that. Paul says he became poor so that we can become rich. And he rides in on a donkey and he rides in on his way to fulfilling his purpose in life. He rides in on this donkey. And as we uh, sit around on this text today, I want us to focus in on this idea of purpose, not just as Jesus is riding in to Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose, but even the donkeys had purpose. Even the donkeys that Jesus selected were fulfilling their purpose in advancing Jesus and putting him in a place of praise. And I want to stop here to even talk about these donkeys because in essence, God wants to let us know that if God can pull purpose out of a jackass, then surely God can get purpose out of our life. That even after a life living like a jackass, here this donkey is fulfilling his purpose. God is letting us know that even when we've acted a a donkey for so long, even when we acted outside of our character, God still can fulfill purpose in our life. And regardless of where you're from, regardless of the mistakes that you've made, regardless of the sins that you've committed, regardless of where you come from in life, regardless of where you are right now in your current situation, God is looking to use you to fulfill some purpose in your life. And Jesus calls on these donkeys, the donkey and the coat, and he told his disciples that these were donkeys that have, have been unused. These were donkeys that needed to be untied. And these were donkeys that it was a donkey and a colt. It was, it was two generations of donkeys that Jesus was looking to use. He, he calls on these donkeys, these donkeys that had been unused. These donkeys that had been rejected. These donkeys that had been overlooked. These, these, donkeys, these donkeys that have been put aside, Jesus wanted to use them. And maybe God is looking to speak to us even on this Palm Sunday, that even though you've been rejected and abused and misused, and even as you've been overlooked, God is still looking to use you and get the best out of your situation because despite of what man and what women have to say, despite of you being rejected by jobs and society and relationships, God still wants to use you because God has purpose in your life. Rejected, abused, rejected, overlooked unused. He still calls on this donkey, but in order for Jesus to even use this donkey, the donkey had to be untied first. There was something that this donkey was connected to that held the donkey back from being used by Jesus. And so Jesus calls on the disciples to untie this donkey, to disconnect the donkey from what has the donkey bound so that Jesus can use this donkey to ride into his purpose. And I don't know who I'm speaking to today. God says you have purpose. God has destiny for you. God has a future for you. But many of us are missing out on Jesus using us because we're tied down to something. Something has us bound. Something that we are connected to is keeping us from being used by Jesus. And so Jesus says through this donkey, there's some stuff that you need to be untied from so that you can fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. What has you bound? What has you tied up? What do you need to untie from? What do you need to disconnect yourself from? What do you need to cut off so that Jesus can use you in a mighty way? Is it some drug, some alcohol? Is it some addiction? Is it some relationship? Is it some mindset, some perspective, some worldview? Is it some mistake from the past, some baggage that you're holding on to? Is, are you tied to depression and fear and anxiety? Are you tied into tradition, religion? What is it that has you bound? Jesus says, whatever it is, you can't fulfill purpose until you allow God to untie you from what has you bound so that you can fulfill some purpose in your life. I'm reminded of Aaron Rawson, that mountain climber in Utah. After he had been climbing mountains, he slipped and fell. And, and as he was falling, rocks were falling on top of him until this huge boulder fell on his arm. And Aaron Rawson, he was stuck on that mountain in Utah for 127 hours. Perhaps you've seen the movie 
starring James Franco. As he is portraying this mountain climber, he is stuck by himself in a lonely place. He is stuck low down in a ditch with this boulder on his arm and he can't move for 127 hours. He was stuck. He couldn't move. He was stagnant until Aaron Ralston poured out a knife and, and begins to literally cut his arm off. He cuts through the flesh, the bones, the tendons. He literally cut off his arm because it was his arm that was keeping him from freedom and from escaping. And once he cut his arm off, he was able to find some help and some deliverance and some healing that he needed. But it wasn't until he cut off what was holding him back. And he even had to cut on himself. He had to cut on his own life. It was something that was painful. It was something that hurt, but he had to go through it in order to find that deliverance. What do you need to cut off? What do you need to remove and disconnect? Is it some relationship? Is it some mindset? What do you have to cut off? I know it's gonna be painful. I know it's gonna hurt, but this is the only way for you to achieve some purpose in your life. Untie yourself, disconnect from what's holding you down so that Jesus can use you. And Jesus tells his disciples to untie that donkey. This donkey, this creature has been acting like a jackass all his life, but I still want to use him. But I can't use her until I untie her from that situation. Untie yourself. But wait a minute. This, this donkey was unused. This donkey had to be untied. But wait a minute. This was two donkeys. This was two generations of donkeys. Jesus says to get the, the, to get the donkey, untie her and bring her coat. So... The text says that Jesus rode on both of the donkeys. So how, how is it that Jesus could ride on two donkeys? Is he riding on two donkeys at the same time? Is he, is he riding on one and, and then he holding on to the other? I mean, how is it that he is utilizing two donkeys? He's utilizing both the donkey and the coat, two generations of donkeys. Well, scholars suggest that as Jesus is riding down from the mountain of Olives, he used the donkey, the female donkey, to use and to maneuver through the terrain of the mountains. And once Jesus came out of that mountain using that female donkey, he then transitioned from the donkey to the coat to ride into the city. He is two generations of donkeys. He used the female donkey to ride down that mountain, the Mount of Olives. And once he got down the Mount of Olives, he uses the younger donkey, the coat, to ride into Jerusalem. And Jesus is giving a word of purpose, not just for us individually, but even collectively as a ministry, as a church, as a community, as a body of Christ. We don't need generations beefing. We need generations coming alongside each other to put Jesus in a place of praise and to advance Jesus on his earth. Jesus is using two generations at the same time. He's looking to use multiple generations in an attempt to advance his kingdom and to bring Jesus to a place of praise. He uses the older generation as they advance Jesus through different terrain and through the different mountains. He used the previous generation who inherited the, the black church from the civil rights movement in that generation. And, and that older generation had to deal with terrain that, that this younger generation, we don't understand that we, we didn't live through that. We didn't go through that. But Jesus has used the older generation to a point now where now he's trying to give that older generation some rest. Now he's trying to relieve the older donkey so that the coat can ride Jesus into the environment of social media. He, he's using the cult to bring in Jesus into conversations on gender equality and sexual identity. He's using the younger generation to bring Jesus into a place that he's never brought him before. But, but the younger generation couldn't do it had it not been for the older donkey. And Jesus uses multiple generations to advance his kingdom and to bring Jesus to a place of praise. And here it is, the King of Kings, Mary's baby, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who's rich in houses and in lands is riding in on a donkey on his way to being crucified on an old rugged cross only to be buried in a borrowed tomb. He's riding in on this donkey. And I love it because 
The only reason why he was able to get a hold of the donkeys in the first place was because Jesus used, the text says, two disciples. He called on two disciples to go ahead into the next village to bring him back these unused donkeys. He, he, he called on two disciples to partner up with him in an attempt to fulfill purpose in his life. Jesus is teaching us a lesson that when you and I are moving in purpose, that when you and I are pulling up on purpose, that when you and I are looking to fulfill purpose, we can't do it by ourselves. We need some people that will partner up with us in purpose. We need some people that will put us and help us get to a place to fulfill what God is up to. We need some people around us who can fulfill the word of God in our life. And Jesus called on two disciples because he is teaching us that we can't fulfill purpose by ourselves. And I know it's difficult in this day and age, even as we are practicing social distance. And even as we are continuing to be quarantined in some instances, as we are being disconnected from our friends and our family, this is a lonely time. It's easy to slip into loneliness. It's easy to slip into selfishness. It's easy to have an individualistic mindset. I mean, we live in a world of social media. This is the most connected that we've ever been, yet this is the most lonely that we've ever been. This is the most that we've ever had to deal with individualism and selfishness and narcissism. We've been isolated and disconnected from our community and our people who can help us to get into purpose. We've been isolated. I mean, think about it. We live in the era of the selfie. We can't even trust people to take a picture of ourselves. We got to do it by ourselves. This is the era of selfie. This is the era of individualism. We've done it by ourselves. But Jesus says, there's no way for you to fulfill purpose disconnected from people who can put you in a place where God can use you. And he called on two disciples. In essence, he wants us to evaluate and to analyze our circle and our village. Who, who, who are the people that can help us fulfill the purpose? Don't be so introverted that you are missing out on the partners that can push you into your place of purpose. Don't be so isolated that you're missing out on the circle that can get you to your place. I mean, Noah needed his wife and his sons and his daughter-in-laws to build that ark and to survive that storm. Abraham connected with his wife to fulfill purpose in bringing out baby Isaac. Even Joseph, even while he was in prison, was able to get to the palace because he had a partner that negotiated with the king that even while the king couldn't find anybody to interpret their dream, Joseph was able to get out of the prison because he had a partner in the palace that helped out. Do you have people around you that can push you to your purpose? Paul had Silas and Timothy. Jesus had his disciples. Who do you have that could push you to your purpose? We need some partners in our life. And I love it. Jesus, he calls on these disciples, but the text, they, he, he never mentioned the disciples. Matthew never mentioned the name of these disciples because Jesus is looking for some people who are able to put purpose over popularity, who, who, who's able to fulfill purpose and, 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 and reach the future without the fame and what other people are thinking about them. These are unnamed disciples. Matthew doesn't mention the names because perhaps had he mentioned the names of the disciples, the disciples would have got full of themselves saying, well, Jesus never would have made it to Jerusalem had it not been for me. Jesus would have never got connected with those, with those donkeys had it not been for me. And Jesus called on unnamed disciples because that's who Jesus is looking for. He's looking for some people who can fulfill purpose without popularity who can fulfill destiny and future without the platform and without the, the well-named brand. We, he's looking for people who's willing to put purpose over popularity. He's looking for those who don't need their name in the spotlight, for those who don't need their name on the flyer, for those who don't have to be tagged in the post, for, the, for those who, who don't have to be recognized and don't need the attention. He's just looking for those who are willing to put Jesus in a place of praise, even as we are fulfilling purpose in our life. And here is Jesus. He calls on these two disciples, these disciples who were able to put purpose over their popularity. But these were disciples that were able to get to the right place. 
Jesus says, go to the village ahead of you. Get to that place. And when you get to the right place, that's where you're able to fulfill some purpose in your life. And for these disciples, it was a geographical place they had to get to. But for you and I, it may not be geographical. It may be spiritual. It may be emotional. It may be psychological. You and I, we need to get to a right place, a right place of prayer. That's what these last 40 days of, of fasting and praying was all about as we sacrifice the physical to get to the right place in the spiritual so that God can use us to fulfill some purpose in our life. What place do you need to get to? It was a place that was ahead of them. For many of us, we keep looking behind us. We keep looking in our paths. We keep looking beside us, seeing what other folk are doing and comparing our lives with the lives of others. Jesus says, no, you got to get to the right place. And the right place is what is ahead of you. David says, I'll look to the hills for which cometh my help. My help comes from God. We learn from the lesson of Lot's wife that if you look behind you, you can get real salty. Life will destroy you the longer that you stay focused on what is behind you. But Jesus says, look ahead of you. Paul says, I look. Paul says, I, I, I press forward to the mark of the high calling of Jesus, forgetting those things that are behind and press forward toward the mark. You got to look ahead of what God is doing because God says that your purpose ain't in your past. Your purpose is in your future. Your purpose is what is in what a, is what a, ahead of you. Look to the hills for which cometh your help. And Jesus had his disciples get to the right place and they bring Jesus both the donkey and the coat. And as Jesus is riding in this, this triumphal entry, the Bible says the people begin to praise God in that place. They begin to, to cry out with a loud voice as the Bible says in verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They're praising Jesus as he makes his way into Jerusalem as people are putting clothes, their, their garments on the ground because they didn't even want the donkeys that were carrying Jesus to have to put their feet in that dirty road. And even as those who couldn't afford the, uh, enough garments to put on the ground, they took the, the, the palm branches from the trees and began to wave them in the air and to claim victory even in a defeated situation because these are people who are oppressed. These are people who were poor. These, these were people who were victim of the Roman government in that system. But even yet and still, they are praising in the midst of their pain. And they're bringing those palm trees, those, those palm branches that represent peace and triumph and victory and deliverance. They're calling on Hosanna, the one who saves and salvation. But then they, they said Hosanna to the son of David, the son of David. That, that, that is a political title that represents the Messiah. The Jewish people believe that the Messiah will come and to overthrow the Roman government and establish Israel as, as the kingdom and reclaim the throne of David. And, and the people begin to praise God saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, the one who saves us from our sins, but the king of David who saves us from satanic systems of the empire. Calling on Hosanna, the one that can bring salvation to my souls, but calling on the son of David that can free the oppressed and to set the captives free. Because this is what Jesus was all about. Even as he comes to the earth, this 33-year-old this now, as he on his way to Calvary, he comes and he was giving free health care to those who were sick, free food to those who were hungry, looking out for the poor and the left out, talking to women in public, flipping over tables in the temple, pushing the, and challenging the status quo of the religious institution. And all that Jesus was doing, it got him in trouble. To the point now he's on his way to being crucified. But even in that in that defeated situation, as those oppressed people are praising their Messiah, they're praising them even while they're still oppressed. They're praising them even while they're still in, praying, in pain. They are praising him even in their problem. They're giving God praise even while they still have yet to experience victory. 
Because this is what Palm Sunday is all about. It challenges us to praise God even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our problem, even in the midst of what we're going through because Jesus brings the victory and we can praise God over the victory that we have in Jesus even in a defeated situation, even in the midst of our defeated circumstances, we can still give God praise because Jesus is worthy of our praise despite of how bad our circumstances are. Do you have enough faith to praise God even in the midst of what you're going through? Do you have enough, to, enough faith to look at the future victories that God has in store for you? It reminds me of the 2017 Cleveland Browns. 2017 Cleveland Browns, they went defeated that year. They were 0-16, they didn't win not one game. And, and even after a defeated season, the fans of the Cleveland Browns got together to raise money for a celebration and a parade right at the Brown Stadium in Cleveland. They, they had a team that went defeated, 0-16, and 16, but, but they still had enough team spirit to galvanize and come together to celebrate a defeated team. So much so that they raised on GoFundMe $10,000 and had over 20 floats at a parade. It was cold that day. It was snowing. It was uncomfortable. They were in a defeated season, but they still found a reason to praise and to celebrate. And if fans can find team spirit after their team had a defeated season, how much more shall you and I, those of us who are children of God, can praise God even in a defeated season because we serve an undefeated God. I know it looks bad, but God is still good. And because God is still good, I can praise him in advance. I can praise him because I got the victory. I can praise him because my win is in Jesus. And as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, yes, he's on his way to be crucified, but he's on his way to the crown. Yes, he's on his way to the cross, but he's on his way to the resurrection. Yes, he's on his way to the grave, but he's on his way to sit on the right hand of the Father interceding for you and I. I know it looks bad, but God is still good, and we share in God's suffering to share in his glory. Jesus says, "I nobody takes my life. I put my life down, and even though I put it down. I'm going to pick it up again. Jesus says in this life, you shall have tribulation, but don't fret because God has overcome the world. And if you believe that Jesus has overcome the world, you ought to be in a place of praise. Give God praise in the midst of what you're going through because God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. If you know that God is good, you can praise him even in advance because Jesus came from heaven to earth to show us the way from the earth to the cross. My debt he paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Even though I'm in pain, even in oppression, I'm still going to lift his name on high because Jesus puts us in a place of purpose so that we can give him all the praise. God bless you. Hosanna to God in the highest. Our Lord indeed is worthy to be praised. We already have the victory. The victory is already yours. You got to receive it by faith, believe it by faith, live it out. Matter of fact, move in that purpose and walk in that purpose and move towards that destiny and victory that God has already predetermined for you. And it all starts with a right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Pastor Jay made it very, very clear that the Lord made his moves in his purpose so that you and I can get right with God. Now it's time for us to take advantage of that. You need to be a Christian. You need to be saved. I want to help you to give your life to Christ by faith. You, here's what the, the book of Romans says. It says that you have to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. And when you do that, you shall be saved. In the same book of Romans, it says, 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to lead you in prayer. I'm going to pray out loud. I want you to pray out loud right behind me. Follow me in prayer. I'm going to have you call on the name of the Lord. And when you do that, you're going to be saved. Let's take it to God in prayer right now. Repeat after me. Father, I come right now. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. I receive Jesus by faith. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hosanna to God in the highest. Let me welcome you to the family of God. You're already a daughter of Christ. You're already a son of God. You're already in the family because of your faith. Now go ahead and email us here at membership at easternstarchurch.org. We've been praying for you. We've been sharing Jesus now. We've been lifting you up before the Lord that you might be saved. And now you're saved. So help us to know that God has heard our prayers and answered our prayers. Membership at easternstarchurch.org. Go ahead and email us. And those of you already saved, you're already Christian, you've already accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you had this disconnect with the church. This is your time to reconnect, to, to get reconnected to the people of God, the house of God, and the work of God with the church. Email us at membership at easternstarchurch.org so we can help you in your discipleship walk with God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. It is time for the offering. It is time for us to do what the word of God told us, to bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse. And God helps us to understand whenever we operate in faith and obedience to him, there is a blessing attached to it. God will open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. All the wonderful things we've been able to do in ministry and still doing in ministry is because of the generosity of the people of God. Thank you so much for your giving so that souls can be saved, lives can be changed. The gospel is carried throughout the world uh, via the internet and technology and, and the digital space. And then of course, what we do with healthy food options, whether we're giving food away through the care center or providing food through the, the Rock Fresh Market or our, our urban farm. And so there's so many things that are going on. We support Sankofa School of Success, the elementary school, Rooted School of Indianapolis, the high school that meets on our campus. We, when all the banking institutions left Arlington Woods, uh, here in Indianapolis in 46218, then we were able to bring in Federal Health Credit Union to deal with these wonderful programs for low-income families. And I could just keep going on and on, all the things we're doing, building the, the new houses, renovating old houses and the apartments and all the things we're doing, the, the food we give away, the clothes we give away, the assistance for utilities and rent, all of this stuff is because of the generosity of the people of God. And I want to say thank you for your support. Now, those of you who want to participate in the offering, we have several options for you. One, you can text to give. Text 45777 with ESC in the message field with your amount. Or you can mail it to us at 5750 East 30th Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46218. Or you can go to our website to give, easternstarchurch.org. There's that tab there for give. Click on that give tab. Go ahead and make that generous contribution to help advance the kingdom of God. Let's go ahead and ask God's blessings upon our gifts today. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for sending Jesus, for helping us to see Jesus move in his purpose and even utilizing things that the, that's least likely to be used, whether it's a donkey or a colt, to still be able to come unto Jesus and be blessed and be honored and advance Jesus in this world. Thank you for giving us that privilege, dear God. And we praise you, Father, that after we see Jesus modeling moving in purpose, now we can move in purpose. We make ourselves available to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Use us in your service. And Lord, as we give these gifts today, we pray to God that they'll be pleasing in your sight. I pray to God that you'll take them and bless them and stretch them. 
and use them, dear God, to advance your kingdom on this earth. And Lord, those that are giving, I pray you give back to them good measures, press down, shake it together. I pray you run it over in their life. We already believe that we have the victory in Jesus name. And it's in that name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, thank you for your support of the work of God. Thank you for your support of ministry. You have a lot that's going on. I know today we're closing out our 40 day fasting and praying. I praise God that you participated. I praise God you hung on in there. And I already know God has already answered some of our prayers. He's already moved in a supernatural way. There's some wonderful, wonderful things that have transpired. I can't wait to tell you at a future time about some of those things that have happened. And I'm still looking for God to continue Continue to answer as we set aside 40 days in, in the presence of God with fasting and with praying. And we're coming down now as we get to the end of our share Jesus now. It won't be the last time we share Jesus now, but you know what I'm talking about. We've been fasting and praying for people to be saved, unchurched, unsaved. We've been sharing our faith reading that letter, allowing them to see the video that we've downloaded with, with me sharing the love of God. And now on next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that's when we wanna make sure that we've invited them to one of our three virtual services. I'm gonna preach a message about the love of God, salvation in Jesus. I'm, I'm shouting already because I know what I'm going to say. And I just know that God loves us so much that he sent his son to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can get right with God. And I'm believing that those unsaved and unchurched people, it's going to be different now. They're going to be saved, recommit their life to Christ, the church and the kingdom. And so make sure we follow through with our share Jesus now in inviting our Yes. Well, again, I praise God for each of you. I love y'all so much. I know we're not on site. We're still online and I miss you guys and I love you guys, but I'm so grateful that you're still honoring God and worship him and supporting the work of God. Now, let me go ahead and offer God's benediction to us on this Palm Sunday. Hallelujah. Don't forget to get your praise on for Palm Sunday because he indeed is worthy to be praised. Hosanna to God in the highest. May God bless you and keep you. May God have his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. May God turn his countenance towards you and grant you peace. And I pray God will do that today and forevermore in Jesus name. Amen.